Hello and welcome to this series about advanced cleanup with InPaint and Paint. My name is Ben Brownlee for Boris Effects. Now when we're doing cleanup on a shot like this one, there's often the fast way of doing it and the right way of doing it. And using Silhouette, I'm going to show you both. So we're going to be taking a look at the new InPaint node, but seeing how we can support that with traditional paint techniques and also looking at some keying and rotoscoping as well. Foremost in my mind is how we deal with these things quickly and efficiently. So I'm going to be showing you some speed techniques about how we can do both of those things. All right, so let's get on with the shot. So here's the shot that we're going to be working with. And this is the after version. So if we take a look at the woman in the red and take a look at the same t-shirt that we're going to be working on. Yeah, we want to get rid of It's Sunny in LA. This might be factually true, but it is not something that we want to advertise. And we're going to use a combination of techniques to, uh, to deal with this. And if we take a look at this shot in motion, you'll see there's a few things we have to pay particular attention to. And you know, one of the big things is the, the creasing that's happening in here. If this was just a plain t-shirt, it would be a lot easier to, uh, to patch this in. Um, but we have quite a lot of creasing happening along there, combined with the, uh, the, the fast movement that's, that's happening too. Now I'm using Silhouette as a plugin here inside of After Effects, but these same techniques work whether we're working in the standalone or Silhouette as a plugin in any other supported host. And let's open up the Silhouette interface. And as this is the first time that we've been into this shot, we need to just save out a new project. I will only create a new folder in here. That's called Silhouette Projects. Just so we know where everything's going to be stored. There we go. And T-shirt cleanup. Give this a number 01. Now we can choose the type of template that we want to start with. We want to start with a composite, paint or roto. But we're going to be doing some paint work. So let's start with paint. And my working depth, I'm going to set this down to 8-bit just for speed of recording. And let's hit create project. So Silhouette has set up our initial tree with the input, a roto, a paint node and an output. The first thing we're going to do though is not use any of these particular nodes. I'm going to use a node that was introduced in Silhouette 2022, which is the InPaint node. Now, if you don't want to go searching for nodes inside of the nodes area, we can also just hit the tab button and it will bring up a little search bar for us. And I can type in InPaint or InPaint and hit return. And that will put the InPaint node after my selected node. Let's just come to a frame where we can see the T-shirt uh, clearly, which is going to be frame number one. Zoom in a little bit. And let's look at what the InPaint node does. Taking a look on the left hand side, we see some very familiar tools. Like these are all the same tools as you would find in the Roto node. And they function in the same way. They just happen to have one other secret. So I'm going to take just a regular uh, ellipse tool. And I'm just going to add a big circle over here. And you'll see the shape now becomes an InPaint object. So what's in paint doing? Well, let's turn off the overlays over here. What it's doing is it's taking pixels from the surrounding area of the object and drawing them in to the center. And if we go down to the bottom right hand corner, we can have a look at the different algorithms that are being used to draw those in. And some of these may work better for a particular shot. And we have elements like smoothness. So if I take that down to zero, zoom in a little bit there. I take my edge softness down as well. You can see those pixels are being, you know, stretched inwards like that. And it gives us very visible lines. So if we take the smoothness up, that helps to get rid of those lines. And edge smoothness helps to sort of soften the transition between the in-paint object and the original. And I'll use zero to turn my overlay back on again. And even with this simple shape, there are two things that I'm going to take special care of. Uh, the first one is what's happening on the edges. I'm going to try to make sure that I don't bring in pixels that I don't want to. If I go too far over the edge here, 
I'm going to start drawing in pixels from the hair, and that's not exactly what I'm uh, what I'm after. Let's make sure that this shape is maybe a little bit smaller, but doesn't take in any of that dark area from the hair, so we don't get shadows from the hair, fake shadows from the hair. This leaves a little bit of area that's not painted. That's fine. The other thing that we need to be aware of is the direction of these folds as well. And this is something we can deal with in the parameters in the bottom right hand corner again. If we move over here, we have a group that's called stretch. And let's turn my stretch on. I'm actually going to turn my smoothness off at the top here so we can see what the stretch is doing. I'll take my smoothness down here as well. So what stretch is doing is it's stretching those pixels in a particular direction. And by default, that angle is set to zero, so it's stretching horizontally. If I move this angle around, you'll see at some point the angle is going to line up with the fold. That's great. So let's bring my, my softness back to where it was. I think it was at four, around about there. And I can bring the softness in the stretch up a little bit as well. Again, just to take away from those little streaks. And now we get a nice transition that respects those folds. Now, at this point, the eagle-eyed of you, and probably not the uh, so eagle-eyed of you, will have noticed that there's quite a lot of noise in this image. It's especially visible in the uh, the blue and the greens, and that's going to you know, affect how this, this area looks here. We're not going to worry about that. We're going to get into grain management a little bit later, but we're going to just keep our focus on the in-paint tools. Okay, so I have my initial shape for this bit, but we're still getting some areas over here. So what I can do is I can create up another smaller area that overlaps over the top. And if I turn the eye on and off, we can see exactly what that is doing too. And that's helping us out. I will do a bit of a stretch on this one as well. Uh, we'll keep the angle relatively consistent with where we had it before. What was that? It was about, yeah, 55. Excellent. I can just bring the edge smoothness up just to hide that a little bit there. Now, what's interesting to note, let's zoom in a little bit here so we can see this a bit easier. I'm also going to come up and use the display controls up the top here just to see whether changing up the gamma and the gain are going to help me show this a little bit easier. We can, mm, Maybe it's not as easy as I expected, but hopefully you should be able to see what I'm what I'm pointing at. So if I turn the overlays on, take a look at the outline of this shape. If I turn the overlays off, you can still see the outline of the shape, yeah? And that's because layer order is very important because the in-paint is being processed from bottom to top. So the layers over the top are happening on top of what's ever happened to the in-paint underneath it. So if I move circle two, which is my small circle, underneath circle one in the object list, take a look what happens to that uh, border. Ooh, that takes it away and, and makes it a lot smoother because that in paint is being drawn into the center. So anytime we're using small objects, we run the risk of bringing in a color that's maybe not 100% suitable for what we're trying to do. So think about layer order a little bit as well as where the, uh, where you're drawing the pixels in from. So let's bring that back down there. Let's turn our gain and our gamma back. And let's change the viewer between foreground and output to see the before and after. I can use the keyboard shortcuts one and two to be able to do that. So before and after, yep, nice. That's the top line. Let's uh, come and give these a certain color. Let's make these ones green. Just so when we look at the overlays, we can see what's happening. And we'll do the same thing for Sunny. Okay, I'm going to try doing the same technique, though, that we did on the first one, which is to take one big shape and draw that over the top. Okay. And I'll do the same as we did previously. So take the stretch, bring that stretchiness up, and that angle was, it was around about 55, wasn't it? And what you'll notice sometimes as you're doing these is that sometimes using a big object isn't always the best idea. 
So we can cover this area. It's not 100%, but you know, it, it's, it's covered anyway. Let's see what happens if we move this one over. Let's turn the overlays back on. I'm gonna to come to my transform and come over here. And we've got one big blob and I'll turn the stretch amount up to 100%. And let's change the angle. I'll see if I can find the perfect angle for these, uh, for these creases. What you'll see is that because these creases are going in lots of different directions, one big blob is not the way to solve this, but also bringing in a lot of helmet, which again is a, a suboptimal, let's say. So the better way to handle this area isn't to do one big blob, it's actually to, uh, to do this in a few different stages. So let's get rid of that circle three, we don't want it. I'll come back to my first frame. I'll remove the uh, display options for a second just to keep the viewer clean. And what I'm gonna do instead is create one smaller object. Now, I do not expect this object to be able to cover everything that I want, and I don't expect this object to look perfect across the entire range of it. So let's bring our stretch amount up. We'll go all the way to 100 when we're working out what's happening. And let's move our angle so that it is fitting and suitable. I'll turn off the overlays here, it's probably easier to see it. Yeah, so we, we can move this angle so it's fitting and suitable for this particular area. And here it's probably closer to 90, well actually, yeah, 80 is looks pretty good on this because the, the folds themselves are a bit more upright. I'll change my edge softness and my regular softness to fit in properly there, excellent. Okay, so now I have a good shape. Let's duplicate that object. So we can duplicate this by having the object selected in the uh, object list and just using Control or Command D just to make a copy of it. Then I'll use the transform tool, which is T, and just bring a, another copy over the top. Then we just use the regular sort of roto shortcuts. So hold down control or command and I can move and transform that shape around until it's fitting and cutting out the next bit that I want to do. And I'm gonna do this a few times and in a f uh, over several different bytes, we can start eating away at this, uh, at this text. This last one, I might just yeah, make that a little bit bigger. Let's have a little look. And because we've got these working individually, I can come into this shape and change the angle. So that's actually fitting a bit more with the, the local, you know, angle of the, uh, of the crease that's happening there. Same with this one. And this is going to give us a much more successful look over the, uh, over the top of everything. And here's a nice little trick. If I want to change multiple parameters simultaneously across multiple shapes, I can do that. I just have to have the uh, shape selected and maybe change the smoothness across all of those shapes and the edge softness as well. Cool, let's turn on the top two as well. Give these new shapes another color. Lovely, and let's go before, after, before and after. Now at this stage, I'm not looking for perfection. And as we mentioned a little bit earlier, we need to do grain management. I haven't forgotten about it. It's very, very important anytime we're doing paint. But on our first frame, it's not looking too bad. But now we have to do this across the entire image. Okay, well, this is fairly straightforward now. And that's simply because the in-paint tool set works so similarly to Roto. Uh, so let's put all of these shapes inside a layer and we will call this one shirt track because guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna use these shapes to track everything in. So let's go into the track. I'm actually, I'll take this into foreground so you can see what's happening here. Uh, and I'll just use the um, silhouette built-in planar tracker. We do have the mocha tracker right here, but this should be absolutely fine. Uh, I'll set my tracking features to auto or leave those at auto. 
the motion model is going to be a fine because it's not a position scale and rotation there is a little bit of twisting in there and everything else we'll just leave at default so let's track this forwards okay and a few seconds later you'll see that these have been tracked in nicely all right so what does that what does that mean let's come out of the tracker let's come back into our output and i'll turn the overlays back off again let's just play that forward and that's actually not too bad a job at all like right from the get-go uh, there's a few things we can change up though and this is the advantage of having these as just regular shapes so we've now got our tracking data driving the regular shapes, but that doesn't mean that we can't come in here and still do some animation on these shapes. So I'm going to try just to, to wherever I see any sort of obvious spilling coming through, I'll adjust my shapes up and we'll probably have to do very, a very limited amount of changes here. And that, that seems to be all right for a first pass, but take a little look on the left hand side here. I have a bit of helmet coming in and because it's on the edge, it's wanting to use those edge pixels to in paint or fill in. Okay, this is gonna happen and we're just gonna have to figure out ways of dealing with it. One of the ways is to just try to get that out of the way, you know, accept the fact that there are gonna be some pixels that we can't come in and uh, use in paint on and just get it out of the way that's one way of dealing with it Let's undo a couple of times uh, the other way of dealing with it is to change the algorithm so that instead of using one of the uh, algorithms that draws pixels in from the surrounding area that we use something like a clone and then we can use like a clone offset even just sort of click and drag this around to clone the pixels over the top here. Uh, and that might work very nicely in this case. Let's have a little look. Move over here. Yep, that works out fine. And then when it comes to things like the ones down here, there are gonna be letters like this L, for example, that we just have to say, mm, actually, I'm just gonna avoid doing anything with that there and in paint isn't going to be the right technique for dealing with this particular area uh, the other thing that's happening let's just uh come to our last frame the other thing that's happening is because we're using stretch let's uh do that there the angle doesn't always match up across the entire range of the clip uh, but this is fine because in the same way that we could keyframe the shape we can also keyframe things like the uh, the stretch angles uh, so i'm not chasing my tail around all the time i'm going to stabilize out my viewer with the uh, the shirt track so that we can see what's going on there there we go makes things a little bit easier and let's select all of the shapes and add a keyframe to the angle on the stretch across all of them on the first frame and on the last frame let's come in and well we'll take one shape at a time i think on this and we're just gonna match the angle up. So this angle on the main one becomes a lot more uh, vertical. So we set that to around about 83 or wherever it needs. Make it a little bit more upright, just so it's fitting in with the surrounding areas. And at some point you'll see like the shape just lock in and you'll go, ah, oh, yeah, that's, that's where it needs to be. And just sort of jumps in with the folds, only takes a moment. There we go, let's zoom out a little bit there, just play that through. I'm just looking for like inconsistencies here uh, and I can see one on this area here and which circle is that well that's our main circle and I'm just going to change the angle up and at some point that just locks in and gives us that nice smooth look so that's the first bit of setting up our in paint I'm going to go and just add in another couple of shapes uh, in exactly the same way actually for the for the in i don't think i'm going to be able to do anything with the l so i'm not going to let's just keep duplicating these things up 
I make these new three shapes just a different color. Right, we've already seen what I'm going to do at this point, so I'm just going to do this off camera and I'll be back to you when this is finished. And here's where we've landed. Not looking too bad. I decided that anything that was happening down here was looking terrible, so I just got rid of that shape. So that's that's the only big big change. Um, here's what it looks like when it's not stabilized. There we go, not too bad. And a lot of the time, this could actually be all right. If we're gonna stick something else over there, we just need to patch it up a little bit. This could be fine, but we're not. We're just gonna do the removal, which leads us on to the next section. Now, the next section should be paint because we're gonna use Silhouette's manual paint tools just to tidy this up a little bit. But there is a reason that the Roto node is above the paint node. And that's because for tricky areas, like the bottom of the shirt down here, we're gonna need to have some way to exclude this helmet because this helmet is gonna be the most annoying thing that happens when we're trying to, uh, to paint this out. This sort of thing is generally handled in one of two different ways. Either we just blow the whole thing out and just over paint and bring the helmet back in, or we can use some tools within Silhouette to exclude this helmet area. Uh, and that's what we're gonna do in the next section. So let's take a little break now and we're gonna come back and we are going to fix this helmet. Thanks for joining me so far. We have hours of other Silhouette training available now at the Boris FX website. And if you want to download a free trial version of Silhouette or any of the Boris FX products, simply head on over to borisfx.com. <laughs>